Alrighty, following up on the how to water Phalaenopsis orchids, Thorns and Roses requested this video on how to fertilize Phalaenopsis orchids. As we grow our Phalaenopsis orchids in different climates and setups, including mounted, I am going to break the fertilizing and supplement recommendation down into all those categories with the focus on average humidity in your conditions. Why is humidity the focus? Well, I'm going to discuss fertilizing and supplementing. I'm glad you asked. For me, humidity plays a huge role as to how high your concentration can be without burning the roots as well as how often would you need to fertilize your fowls because your pot dries out or as in the case with mounts, the mount dries out within hours. Humidity plays a huge role as to what you can get away with and what will cause issues based on the concentration. I refer to average humidity conditions using three categories. High humidity is 80%, medium humidity at 60% and low humidity at 30%. If I were to say that I am in a dry climate, then that would mean little to nothing. So my humidity references are average. And when it comes to fertilizing Phalaenopsis orchids, you may have to adjust your concentration if on the day of fertilizing or supplementing, your humidity is lower than average so as to avoid root burn and vice versa. If you are in a dry climate and suddenly you have a high humidity day, you can go a little bit more gung-ho with your concentration. So it's always a good idea to keep an eye on humidity levels in your environment and adapt the nutrient concentrations accordingly. And the recommendation of fertilizing Phalaenopsis orchids applies across the board. My setup should not deter you from thinking that the following pointers are not relevant if you're growing in a wet-dry cycle. As a matter of fact, because you are growing your Phalaenopsis in a wet-dry cycle, humidity levels will play an even more important role when it comes to getting the concentration of your nutrient mix right. With semi-hydroponics, there is a lot of grace because the roots in the pot are consistently damp and the humidity levels only come into play when it comes to how quickly will the moisture on the surface of the pot evaporate, resulting in possible unabsorbed salts to remain behind which could burn the roots. To keep things simple as well as effective without cutting corners regardless of the media of choice, your pH should be at 6.5 for the most part. For specific examples, please leave your questions in the comments and we can address those in greater detail with more variables if you would like to bring your specific situation to my attention. And please also give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel for the additional much needed support. Thank you so much. So, best case scenario, high humidity. If you are in a wet dry cycle, the size of your Phalaenopsis will determine how much it is going to need. Large Phalaenopsis with large structures and plenty of them can easily take 800 parts per million. In all examples, I'm going to recommend what you are trying to avoid is that the orchid starts to absorb older leaves because it's pulling nutrients from them to support the active growing point. It is normal for older leaves to eventually die back having served their purpose, but it is something we can avoid avoid and we should aim to keep them around for as long as possible. Supplementing with calcium nitrate, CalMag and other additives like seaweed is going to help maintain those older leaves and for the different supplements, if that is what you choose to do, then consider going in at 300 parts per million with calcium nitrate, 300 parts per million with CalMag and 200 parts per million of seaweed. Personally, I start to supplement my orchids late fall. I focus on supplements as opposed to fertilizer during the cooler months of the year because they need to build up a resilience for the stressful time ahead. I usually stop supplementing with the calcium nitrate and CalMag early spring and focus heavily on fertilizer only because they will come into active growth early summer. Some sooner than others, yes, but for the most part that is my regime in a climate in which I am dependent on mother nature providing light and temperature. In a controlled growth space, the supplementing is pretty much the same, however, you do not have the challenging conditions to contend with. Instead, you are helping with the growth of spikes and providing the much needed energy for your fells to bloom. The reason I stopped supplementing with the additives late spring is because my fertilizer takes over so that the orchid gets a well-balanced diet during active growth. 
The previous months of supplementing are now within the orchid system and the fertilizer takes over from there. However, when it comes to seaweed, please remember that seaweed is packed with growth hormones. So, I do not use seaweed during the cooler conditions, the temperature drop period when the orchid is being triggered to grow spikes. I start the seaweed applications early spring in preparation for the active growth period, which will and can coincide with the orchid being in bloom. But I want to get the hormones into the orchid it ahead of time just to help things along a little bit when it comes to growing roots. I stopped seaweed supplementing late fall because by that time Phalaenopsis orchids are pretty much being given cooler temperatures and the growth hormones in the seaweed will clash with the next phase of the orchid's growth cycle, which, if all goes well, is the production of spikes. Supplementing frequency is really on a needs must basis, based on your conditions. I fill my reservoirs every time they go dry. You may need to supplement once a week depending on when your media goes dry. You may alternate between fertilizing and supplementing. However, when it comes to adding supplements, consider the applications as a boost. So you will want to do that at least once a month for the duration of the activity of the orchid. Now, as we go into medium average humidity, the fertilizer levels need to be adjusted adjusted to match the lower humidity conditions so as to avoid salt buildup. The moisture will evaporate fast at the surface of the pot and with that, for a wet dry cycle, I will drop the concentration down to 600 parts per million and possibly 500 parts per million and then monitor if the surface of the pot shows any signs of salt accumulation. As supplementing happens during the cooler months of the year, I consider the previously mentioned concentration acceptable for 60% average humidity without risking anything. And then, in dry conditions, in a wet-dry cycle, you will either need to go real low with your concentration, even for large Phalaenopsis orchids, down to around 300 parts per million to be on the safe side, or what you can do in a wet-dry cycle is fertilize your large Phalaenopsis at the highest parts per million of 800 and then 15 minutes later flush the pot out straight away to avoid any salt accumulation at the surface of the pot. When it comes to semi-hydroponics, the only factor that needs to be considered is how quickly will the moisture on the surface of the pot evaporate. The high humidity will allow for slow evaporation as the media will pull moisture from the air. The dry conditions will have the surface of the media dry out super fast, which can then be countered with either misting the surface of the pot to keep the moisture levels from evaporating quickly, or adding a non-moisture absorbing substrate on top of the actual media preventing from anything evaporating too quickly. As we go down in the size of our Phalaenopsis orchids, adjusting the fertilizer concentration makes logical sense and I administer 600 parts per million for my medium-sized fowls and 300 parts per million for my minis. However, when I supplement my medium and mini fowls, I still go in with the higher concentration of calcium nitrate and CalMag. I do not adjust their levels because of their size. Phalaenopsis love calcium and because we normally grow them at lower light levels, as other orchids take priority when it comes to them needing more light to bloom, the magnesium at the same concentration as that for a large orchid is a wonderful boost for the minis as well. Any salt accumulation on the surface of my pots is largely due to the fact that it has accumulated over the years as I do not repot my Phalaenopsis as frequently, as well as because of my conditions. I cannot flush my pots during the winter months as frequently as I would like to. You may have have that opportunity, so your salt accumulation should be minimal as long as you keep flushing your pots. But I take my salt accumulation in stride, the orchids get their much needed supplements, and every once in a while I will just pick off the salty lecker and replace it with clean and leached lecker. So you see, my focus is on supplementing for at least six months of the year. My supplement concentrations do not change based on the size of the orchid. If I were to change anything, I would go higher with the supplement concentration with the larger fowls. And if your conditions are ideal, then higher concentrations are not a risk. However, the values I suggested will be just fine across the board. And once again, ease on the seaweed. Yes, we want to push our orchids, we want to help them out, but never forget that there is a time and place for seaweed, and too much of a good thing can have adverse reactions within the orchid, which can result in some weird looking blooms, maybe even deformed leaves. But that is not the case with my aurora. However, it is a good visual example as to what structures can do if they were to get too much seaweed after their main growth phase is pretty much done. Done. 
The reason this leaf is wonky is because I did not remove the two spikes this orchid had in 2023 when the orchid started actively growing that leaf. You see, the fragrance of this orchid is so amazingly beautiful, I just could not make myself cut the spikes. The orchid came into active growth and the energy of the two spikes with the super long lasting blooms was competing with the energy the orchid actually needed to grow that leaf. So yes. Even if my orchids are still in bloom, I do cut spikes when they start their new leaves, with the exception of this one in 2023, and I shall not repeat that again. Famous last words. <laughs> Now, if you have mounted Phalaenopsis, then you are in a very lucky position because you only have to consider your average humidity, you do not have to wait for a reservoir to be absorbed or wonder how long it is going to take for your orchid to dry out before you can do the next fertilizer application or supplementing application, the flushing, and will you be able to provide your orchid with all the nutrients it needs in a timely manner because you can interchange fertilizing with supplementing alternating them on a daily basis. Your only consideration is the strength of your nutrient solution and to avoid salt buildup which could easily burn the velamen as you can see with my Phalaenopsis pulchra. But with mounted Phalaenopsis orchids it is so easy to water the mount down with plain water as a flush on a daily basis, especially in dry climates. Allowing the roots to absorb the nutrients, once saturated you can easily go in with plain water and rinse the mount off because the nutrients are already in the cortex. The only thing here is to find the balance of the fertilizer concentration based on your humidity levels, which can be a hit or a miss sometimes because, again, depending on the day, depending on the humidity fluctuations. But that comes with the territory with mounted orchids and while it is a shame to have a little bit of a browning on velamen, it does not affect the function of the roots in any way, shape or form. It does actually provide a visual reminder that maybe we can just tone it down a little bit so that any new roots will be able to continue to grow clean without us burning the velamen. I hope that this breakdown was helpful, that it was simple to follow, if there is anything that sounded confusing, please bring that to my attention, especially seeing as we are growing in such different circumstances worldwide. Thank you Thorns and Roses for the request and thank you so much for watching, especially to the end. I get to wish you a wonderful day on the condition though please that you stay safe. Take care. Bye.